Thank you for the very kind invitation and to ask me to join you in uh, this session. Um, when the organizers proposed this title, I thought that, uh, well, this is clearly wrong. And uh, I thought that it was okay to keep it this way so as to prove you that even the keynote uh, plenary title can be wrong, let alone other things. So, even though not everything is wrong, uh, there's far more things that are wrong in the biomedical literature than most of us suspect upon reading it or using it for making decisions on our everyday life uh, dealing with patients. In most fields and most types of study designs, the majority of what is published has major problems. We have a lot of wonderful achievements in science. We have about 160 million scholarly documents that we can consult in the ease of uh, time, in academic environments, not in the violence of war. Uh, but still, we see horrendous outcomes very often. And we also see horrendous information that is infiltrating us and is not allowing us to get better outcomes. How credible is a study that we're going to come across? It depends on a lot of things. First of all, it depends on what is the pre-evidence odds? Uh, how many comparisons and how many analyses are being made against how many true effects are there to be found? If we're working in a field where really we were very unfortunate and no matter how good our intentions are, there's not much to be discovered, you can imagine that no matter how much we try, uh, we may publish thousands of papers, but this is not going to be very helpful. Conversely, if we're working in a field that Somehow, there's uh, more things that might work. Even with more limited efforts, we might get there. Second, it depends on, on the data, the study at hand. We, we all know that studies are not equal. There's good studies, bad studies, high quality studies, low quality studies, unclear quality studies very often, suspected quality problems, studies, and so forth. It depends on the bias that there exists, and bias can vary a lot from one field to another. It depends on the field, and all of these may depend on each other. So uh, a little bit of uh, math uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, people might sleep during the next three slides, but this is a very simple model. Okay? Forget about the, the equations there. Uh, well, not even equations, just symbols. Some, Greek letters uh, among them. Um, according to this model, there's no bias on planet Earth. Hmm? Everything is perfect. Uh, you know that this is not true, especially after one of the earlier lectures. There's only one team of researchers. Everything that is done is published. Uh, you're like the uh, author at the same time you're the editor-in-chief of the one journal that exists. So you, you accept everything that you do because you, whatever you do is great. And here's how it looks like when you compare what is uh, a research finding, like a treatment effect. Here's a new intervention that I want to use. In reality, a true relationship versus a research finding, something discovered, presented in the New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet. Alpha, for those who may be statistically savvy, is the type 1 error rate. Beta, type 2 error rate. R is the pre-study odds that I was talking about. How many are true in that field of investigation over how many are just null, things that we're wasting our time. And C is just a constant because there's many of us, or, or even here where we have just one team, there's lots of things that we're trying to assess and produce results on. Now, bias could interfere, which means that sometimes some results that should have been quote-unquote negative do become positive. And then you have this U term of bias that is introduced in these equations. And then, luckily, there's many researchers. There's many people who try to attack the same questions or similar questions, and then you have to add a factor of many of these teams trying to get a result that would be exciting, that would be significant, that would be nice looking. So you have that N factor that is introduced in this table. So somehow, if you have that framework, you can run calculations about how likely is 
a statistically significant, quote unquote, positive result that you read in the literature. So it has a p-value of uh, a little bit less than 0.05, let's say. How likely it is to represent something that is really true? If it's a treatment effect, yes, the treatment does work. If it is a risk factor, yes, this is a risk factor. If it is uh, a prognostic factor, yes, this does say something about the prognosis. So you can model that as a function of the pre-study odds of the number of teams and the extent of bias that exists in the literature in the specific field. And this is some overview of the land for different types of designs. If you have a well-powered randomized trial with little bias and one-to-one -one pre study odds, and you get a statistically significant re result just barely scratching below a p-value of 0.05, it's about 85% likely to be true. That's pretty good. It's not 100%, but it's 85%. Now, if you get a p-value of uh, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, that's even better. It may be 90%, it may be 95%, maybe 99%. The, the lower the p-value, the better. If you have a confirmatory meta-analysis of good quality randomized trials, so several randomized trials have suggested that there seems to be something here, they're all very consistent, and then you also run a meta-analysis and you get, again, a statistically significant result. Again, it's about 85% likely to be true. If you have a meta-analysis of small inconclusive trials, even though you get a statistically significant result, it's only less than 50%. It's about 40% likely to be true. If you have a single underpowered phase two well-done randomized trial that gives you a significant result, gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's about 25, 23% likely to be true. If it's poorly done, that goes down. If you have epidemiology, you know, uh, much like the research that I do uh, very often, very little of that survives. Uh, most of the epidemiologic claims that we find when we try to validate them in more rigorously controlled settings, they don't survive. So in the best circumstances, maybe we can get a success rate of 20%. If we're underpowered, that goes down to 10, 12%. And if we go into the massive big data mode that many of us including myself, are working nowadays, a p-value of less than 0.05% means absolutely nothing. It's less than one in a thousand. In many situations, it's less than one in a million likely to mean anything. If it's much, much lower, then I, I might start putting some more attention to that. But uh, most of the time, a single observation alone means very little. In that framework, the post-study odds of a true finding are small if we have any of these situations. If we have small effect sizes that we're chasing, if the treatment effects, for example, of the interventions that we're interested in, even though they might be genuine, are small. And in most medical interventions, the effect sizes tend to be pretty small. I mean, can you think of some intervention in intensive care unit like uh, uh, ARDS, that decrease mortality by 50%. I can think of none. I may think of a few that may have a 10% reduction in mortality, and even that would be questionable. When the studies are small, and, and what is a small study obviously depends on the field, but a study of several hundred people is still a small study, to be honest, in that framework. When fields are hot, which means that there's a lot of interest, many people are working on it, you have large amphitheaters of scientists who are working on the same topic, trying to outpace each other in competition. When there's strong interest in the results, that could be financial interest, conflicts of interest, it could be also academic. I have put forth a theory, I want to defend it at all costs, I believe in it. When databases are large, and we have very large databases nowadays, and when analysis are more flexible, and we do have more and more flexibility on how we can analyze our data. In that framework also, a research finding cannot reach credibility over 50% unless you have this very simple relationship, U less than R, which means that bias must be less than the pre-study odds. Let me translate that in English. If 
Among treatments that we test for effectiveness in ARDS, one is truly effective and 10 are not, you know, among the batch that we are after. We cannot afford bias, conflicts, or other problems to distort more than 10% of the studies. 90% of our studies should be immune. If more than 10% of the studies are distorted, then when we find a statistically significant benefit for a new treatment, it is more likely to be a false finding rather than a true advance. Now, how often is our evidence distorted or suboptimal or not high quality or not good enough? Is it more than 10% likely to occur? Here's a survey of close to 1,400 systematic reviews that were published on the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, 2013 to 2014, and we tried to see how many of those have great assessments. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Cochrane, Cochrane includes systematic reviews on any type of healthcare intervention, including intensive care, of course, but any other type of medical intervention for any disease. So GRADE is a system that is trying to assess the quality of the evidence. It stands for Grades of Recommendation, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And only 44% of these systematic reviews had summary of findings with grade assessments. How about the other 60% almost? Well, most of the time they didn't have these assessments because they couldn't do anything with them. Practically, there was no evidence. The question had been asked, a systematic review had been launched, and the reviewers concluded there's no evidence. We have no data to tell you anything about it. When there was evidence and when someone did go through the great exercise, the quality of the evidence for the first listed primary outcome was high only 13.5% of the time. When all outcomes we listed were considered, then 19.1% had at least one outcome with high quality of evidence. Even when we focus on high quality of evidence information, only 25 of these views had both significant results and a favorable interpretation for that intervention. So we start with 1,400 reviews on 1,400 groups of medical questions on interventions, and we narrow down to only 25 that have high quality of evidence, significant results, and someone is saying, yes, this is something that I recommend you to go ahead and do it. Significance at least statistical significance, means close to nothing nowadays. Almost all scientific papers claim that they have found statistically and or conceptually significant results. Obviously, all my grant proposals claim that what I'm planning to do is highly significant, although I mostly submit very mediocre ideas for funding. About a year ago, we published that paper where we went through text mining of the entire biomedical literature since 1990, and we found that significance is a boring nuisance. 96% of the biomedical literature claims significant results. So, you know, it, it, it means practically nothing. It, it becomes interesting when it's not significant, you know, not when it is significant. Almost any result can be obtained. This is not a joke. I bet that if you want me to get a significant result, just give me any database and I will get it for you. You can see me later. Free of charge. Um, why is that? Well, it's because of vibration of effects and what I call the, the Janus phenomenon. So this is data from the National Household Survey in the U.S. And instead of analyzing the association between vitamin E and death, which is the, the two plots on the far right, instead of assessing, well, vitamin E increases or decreases the risk of death based on these data, I present you one million different analyses. That's easy to do because death is affected by many other things. So if I start considering 19 other things that I can adjust for, like age, gender, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, history of cancer, smoking, exercise, da da da, I have two choices for each one of them, include it in the model or forget about it. So 2 times 2 times 2, 2 to the 19, that's about 1 million, and I'm showing you 1 million analysis, and these plots are showing the minus log 10 p-value on the vertical axis and the hazard ratio on the horizontal axis. If uh, you have results uh, on this side of that V, 
which is about 700,000 analysis, vitamin E decreases the risk of death. It's wonderful. About 300,000 analysis on this side, vitamin E increases the risk of death. It's miserable. So if you like to get a result with increased or decreased risk, I can get it for you very easily. Even the creme de la creme of medical research can easily be refuted. About 12 years ago, I published that paper where I took the most highly cited papers across the history of biomedical science. And I asked, were there any larger, better controlled studies done to see what happened to them? When larger, better controlled studies were done, about 25% of the creme de la creme randomized trials were refuted, and about 85% of epidemiological non-randomized results were refuted. Let's take a look at uh, ARDS that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is uh, an umbrella review that we did a few years ago. We identified 159 randomized trials on ARDS treatment. Does anything decrease mortality? Instead of showing you 159 trials, I'm showing you here just the ones that have more than 50 deaths in at least one arm. So these are the largest ones. Now forget that these are about very different topics and very different interventions. I mean, it's, it's all over the place, all types of interventions being considered here. It's not just an uh, apples and oranges, it's an apples and oranges and celery and pineapples and, and everything. Um, but if you forget that in a moment, and you just try to look at this uh, forest plot, the first observation is that the average is very close to the null, the, the vertical of uh, relative risk of one, you know, no mortality benefit at all. If none of these things worked, this is pretty much what you would get. That's what it would look like. Now, one might say, well, there's a couple of things there, like uh, prone position and um, low, low tidal volumes. They look very nice. So maybe some of those, 159, couple, might be effective. Let's take a look at the most promising ones. Are they real? Low tidal volume, let's put together all the trials on low tidal volume. There's seven trials, 1,481 patients. Is that a lot? I would say no. This is still very modest evidence if you, if you think that this is about something that is so important. This intensive care unit, this is millions of patients that are being handled. We have data on, on 1,400 people. I would, I would argue we would need data on tens of thousands of people to feel secure. But, okay, mortality was not significantly lower as compared to control. There's some trend, but goodness, I mean, we're talking about less than 0 0.05. This is 0 0.20 or so, and also no significantly decrease in barotrauma or ventilator-free days. Prone position, 10 trials, 1869 patients, mortality again, Scratching the 0.05 limit, maybe. And then if you take a subgroup, trials with both prone position and low tidal volumes, then you get a significant result. But this is a subgroup. And subgroups, we know from vast empirical surveys that about 3% of subgroup claims are correct. So maybe that's one. I hope it is. But who knows? Reanalysis. Can we even trust the data? We take what we read for granted. We don't think that someone is cheating us. We are scientists. We're not doing science to cheat each other or cheat ourselves. Well, this is true, and I think that we should trust each other, but at the same time, we do not see the raw data with very, very few exceptions. So here's one exception where study 329 was published around 2000, and it showed that paroxetine and amipramine are very effective and very safe for treating major depression in adolescents. And then people tried to get the raw data, and more than 15 years later, they published a reanalysis after going through a, a, a real adventure of trying to get that information. And the reanalysis of the raw data by independent scientists showed that based on that very same information, paroxetine and amipramine are not effective and they're not safe. Exactly the opposite conclusion compared to the trial that really prompted the widespread use of antidepressants in children and adolescents. Why do we have only one 
effective treatment for stroke and none for Alzheimer's disease. Well, do we have an effective treatment for stroke? Yeah, I, I think we do. We, we have one effective treatment, but you have to run pretty quickly to get to the hospital. And, and then probably it is effective. Well, we have thousands of animal studies and preclinical studies suggesting that we should have had thousands of effective treatments for stroke and for other neurological and cognitive conditions. However, they don't pan out. Why is that? One answer might be that oh, we don't need animal studies. Animals are different from humans. Let's get rid of animal studies, respect animals, and so forth. No, I don't believe that. I think that we need animal studies because you cannot really test everything that comes up as an idea directly on humans. And we have lots to learn from animal studies. But if you look across the board of neuroscience, basic and preclinical investigation, the common theme is that very small sample size studies are performed. I told you about the randomized trials with a couple of hundred people. The typical preclinical study is just a couple of dozen of animals or even a dozen of animals or even less than a dozen of animals. Almost all of them get significant results. But in the mathematical framework that I showed you up front, their trustworthiness is very, very low. When they operate with so small sample sizes, you expect more than 90% of those to be wrong. There's some direct evidence about that. In the last several years, over five years now, the industry has not started taking academic research very seriously. If you have noticed, there's not that many new drugs that hit the market, successfully so. So they said, what's going on here? These people at Stanford, they're telling me that everything that they do in their experiments is, is wonderful, and I, I try and I go nowhere. So they started reproducing the most highly cited academic research that had been published in the very best journals by the very best academic scientists. They tried to follow the exact approach in very large series, their reproducibility success was between 0% and 25%. One project done at Amgen found that only 6 of 53 landmark highly cited studies done by the best academic centers for oncology drug target projects could be reproduced. The conclusion of Glenn Begley in that paper in Nature was that the failure to win the war on cancer has been blamed on many factors, but recently a new culprit has emerged. Too many basic scientific discoveries are just wrong. There's many examples of that same problem across very different types of arrays, of different types of experimentation. Uh, this is just a partial list that I have put together in a review, and they affect research in neuroscience, in pharmacology, in genomics, bioinformatics, stem cell biology, oncology in vitro testing, chemistry-led discovery, computational biology, pathology biomarkers, organizational psychology, and observational research. As an epidemiologist, I'm doing mostly observational research. The track record of my field is zero out of 52 highly prominent hypotheses postulated by observational data being confirmed in randomized trials. Most of the time, it's not just an issue of being right or wrong. It's just that the outcomes are simply irrelevant. You read the paper and you say, who cares about that? Patient-relevant outcomes are understudied. And here's one example from one field that I have tremendous respect for and which probably has the most relevant outcomes on average than any other field that I know. So I said, well, let's see what's happening there. Across more than 1,000 trials of preterm infants for different types of interventions, investigators recorded chronic lung disease outcomes in less than a third of them. In most other fields, the real important outcomes are measured less than 10% of the time. So there are solutions of getting rid of some of these uh, deficiencies and these caveats. And obviously some of them are so easy to see that one just has to say, don't do this, do exactly the opposite. There's 12 families of solutions that have been proposed. Large-scale collaborative research, adoption of a replication culture, registration, pre-registration, sharing, reproducibility practices, containment of conflicted sponsors and authors, 
more appropriate statistical methods, standardization of definitions and analysis, more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improvements of study design standards, improvements in peer review, reporting, and dissemination of research, and better training of the scientific workforce in methods and statistical literacy. Let's take a look at a few of them in a bit more detail. Large-scale collaboration and adoption of replication culture means that instead of having the prototype of each one of us trying to outpace and outcompete our colleagues, we join forces. Instead of running 50 small studies, we perform one with an explicit plan of internal and external replication. And this is a paradigm that has worked in several fields, like genetic epidemiology. Genetic epidemiology, its reproducibility rate was something like 1%, and then scientists decided to change the norm. Instead of publishing these small studies on candidate genes, they joined forces, they have these very large consortia where hundreds of teams may join, and very stringent analytical paths. And, and what we get there, even though its application might be still questioned, is still very, it's at least very robust. Transparent pre-registration can also make a difference. Pre-registration means that I convey to the rest of the scientific community what I am going to do. If it's blue sky science, this cannot be done. If it's uh, completely exploratory, the only thing I have to say, and I need to be honest about that, is that I cannot register that because I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm a great scientist, and I have no clue what I'm doing. If I find something, then I will report, I found that having no clue what I was doing, and please try to replicate it to see if it works. Level one is registration of a data set. I have a data set. It's, it's like having a nuclear bomb. Hmm? A, a data set can generate megatones of p-values, especially some of the data sets that I have are really dangerous. You know, they have millions of observations, big data, electronic health records. I, I can destroy you all. Okay? So uh, people need to know about it. John has that data set. Tomorrow he can launch one million p-values against us. Hmm? <laughs> Level two is registration of a protocol. Ah, I have a protocol. Nice. Okay, a protocol could say different things. I mean, it could have 10 pages of pathophysiology, and it could have zero pages about how am I going to analyze the results. So level three is registration of the analysis plan. Level four is registration of the analysis plan, and here are the raw data. And level five is open live streaming, where I open my computer, I tell you every day in the morning what I'm going to do in the afternoon, and you can come and you can send me suggestions and so forth. Sharing, how is that going to happen? Who is going to do it when and how? We are witnessing a change in the sharing norms. Until recently, it was extremely difficult to get handle of any randomized clinical trials data. Now, there are more than 10,000 randomized clinical trials worth of data that one could get the raw information. Not necessarily directly, one still needs to get through some approval, but they, they can be obtained. And many journals are also moving in the direction of publishing a trial only if the raw data become publicly available. So BMJ and PLOS Medicine have already done that. I hope more will follow. But sharing and moving into a culture of sharing means that we need to think about how exactly it's going to be done, who is going to get the credit, who is going to do the work, where is the funding going to be found, when and if arrogant, rogue analysts come in our way, how will we handle those? Because all of these are possibilities. It's not happening yet, or it's just started to happen. In a survey going to 2014, we looked at 500 randomly selected papers from the biomedical literature. 440 of them would be eligible, about half of them had primary data, None of them shared all the information, and only one of them had a full protocol that was shared, and that was a separate paper. The people had published the protocol as a separate paper. So we have a pretty low starting point, but we, this means you can see it positively, we can make lots of progress. Better statistics and methods. 
we need more transparent statistical analysis plans. We need more statistical training and improved literacy and numeracy of statistical workforce. We need a, a license to analyze, in a sense. We have 20 million scientists who publish scientific work. How many of those are trained well in statistics? Probably less than 10%. How many of those collaborate with someone who's well-trained in statistics? Maybe another 10%. 80% are in the dark. Better study designs. Most of the time we use a very suboptimal study design to answer questions and that costs more and is less likely to lead to something that is useful. Standard features like randomization and blinding of investigators in preclinical animal experiments is happening 10 to 20 percent of the time, although it costs nothing and uh, it would save us from lots of trouble. Computational methods. I'm not sure how often you have come across some software uh, or script, you haven't. Well, indeed, because software and scripts are not shared most of the time. Very complex calculations are happening and no one can really put their hands on them. So about a year ago, we published these recommendations in science where we argue that if you have some software and you have some script, they should be available to others to be able to use them and check them. This is a paper that generated a lot of controversy. We published that about a month ago. And uh, many people were excited. Other people thought we were crazy. Other people hated us. Well, it's a mix. But basically, we said, we are flooding with statistical significance. Yes, ideally, we would like everyone doing science be a professor of statistics. How likely is that going to happen? Not very likely. So we would like everyone to use better statistical methods. Yes, but you need to train people over 30 years. So in the meanwhile, let us at least try to build a dam to avoid some of the flooding, which means instead of having a p-value of 0.05, have a p-value of 0.005 as a cutoff threshold for claiming significance. We can get rid of about 30 to 40 percent of uh, the irreproducible results. But basically, even using statistical significance is not really what we want. For example, is significance testing a good choice for each of these five? Okay, so this is a test now. Be prepared. Developing a prognostic score for intensive care. How many people say yes? It, it could be all of them. No one? Okay. Assessing a diagnostic test for pulmonary embolism. No one. Evaluating a therapy for ARDS in a randomized trial. Uh, a few. Okay, okay. Mining electronic health records. Uh, hardly anyone. Mining big data from metabolomics. Hardly anyone. Well, it's not a good choice for any of those. I, I, I mean, what we are interested in these cases is not refuting an all hypothesis. Is estimating how much information does this score offer us. How good is that diagnostic test? How big is the treatment effect? Can we learn anything about anything from electronic health records? And are there something to be pursued on metabolomics? So who's going to change that norm? Is it going to be institutions? To, to some extent, it could. So institutions could focus on building that new generation of trainees, of students, who would be the next generation professors also, that have core training in experimental methods, experimental design, data selection, data analysis, and so forth, they can keep up with some continuous methodologic education for their investigators, and they can have some guidelines for taking care of some big themes. Uh, I list here fraud, but it's not an issue of fraud. I'm talking about things that are honest errors, not people who just uh, create data that don't exist. We need to find ways to re-engineer our reward system in large scale. Currently, we reward people for publishing more papers, okay? So I write in my CV, I've published 900 papers. So what? Who cares? I have polluted the literature with 900 papers. You know, that, that, that's what I should write, probably. And, okay, productivity is not bad. I, I like writing. I write poetry as well, novels. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. But... We need a bit more than this. We need the rest of the electrocardiogram. We need PQRST, and Q stands for quality, R stands for reproducibility, S stands for sharing, 
NT stands for translational impact of research. So we need to find ways to reward people for focusing on these other four waves rather than just productivity alone. We also need to understand and align the interest of stakeholders. It's not just scientists, it's not just clinicians. There's also other players. There's the industry, there's public funders, there's private funders, there's philanthropies, there's journal editors, there's publishers, there's professional scientific societies, universities, not-for-profit research institutions, supporting non-scientific staff, hospitals, professional facilities, uh, hopefully not bombed, uh, other financial entities that are affected by these services, insurance companies, governments, state, federal authorities, consumers, people, patients who die. And they have very different expectations. Patients don't care about whether we publish or not. Uh, we do. Institutions care about funding. Patients care about translation. Companies want to make profit. All of those stakeholders need to be aligned to make sure that what we get is real, it's true, it's not wrong. To conclude, multiple factors contribute to create a large amount of evidence with low credibility, including, but not limited to, the contact of small, low quality studies, the unaccounted multiplicity and manipulation analysis, diverse biases in design contact and reporting of the evidence, conflicts of interest and other problems. The prevalence of different biases varies across different disciplines, types of designs and settings, and it also changes over time. We do have success stories for research practices that have improved the credibility of the obtained evidence, but more drastic solutions may need to center on reframing the reward and incentive system to offer more credit to high quality, translatable, transparent science that is shared rather than just seemingly significant results. I will close with a big thanks to some of my colleagues who have tolerated me over the years and have helped generate some of the empirical evidence that I showed you today. Thank you.